what it happened when you bring Olan, Olu, and Anand together. So it's a lot of um, sins here to consider, and I know that we are a little um, late in with our time frame for the evening, but of course um, we are open to questions or uh, comments or internal comments here with the three of us, four of us in the, in the stage. But I think that would be fantastic to see the question coming from the, from the audience. And I don't have a question. I just want to say, Magda, thank you for bringing these three people to give this wonderful series of talks. And it's an indication of how much you're bringing to Vanderbilt and Nashville. So thank you. Happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, my feeling. Uh, uh, question, please. I don't want to. I don't want to keep talking. I want to hear you guys. Uh, I think there's a lot of thought here, a lot of uh, material, uh, complex uh, issues, complex topics. Uh, um, fantastic uh, just the position of these three speakers. I really appreciated the kind of a part of visiting to biography and, and uh, of both uh, Holland and Olu, and, and then uh, the curator curating his time in such a brief time, uh, pointing out to us so many interesting details of history and, and political implications and cultural implications within the city. I, I couldn't be more um, pleased uh, in a way in which uh, it's an academic exercise as well, uh, what is happening here uh, tonight. So um, uh, I think Adam and, and Olu and Holland, but it would, be, it would be nice to hear from you guys. Uh, students, or the, yeah. Well, thank you all very much for interesting presentations. And I'm not sure who my question is addressed to. Um, but it occurs to me that in, in European and American societies where, there's, where patronage is so basic to uh, the ongoing, to art uh, being accomplished and, and the artist being able to continue to produce art, that there's kind of a, it's necessarily undermining any political message. <laughs> um, Whereas that may not be true elsewhere, so maybe this is a question for Mr. Cotter and for the group in general, but it, some of the things that you were addressing about, about uh, the presence of art in different societies having a different relationship to the economy. And here I do think it's almost medieval. I mean, uh, so I just wonder if anybody wanted to comment on that idea. Is this uh, working? Uh, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Um, ideally, we, the government would, I think, contribute to, to the arts uh, in, in a way that America, the American doesn't happen in America. Um, that's a big problem here, I think. It's maybe, maybe there's more pat patronage uh, coming from that direction in Europe. I don't know. But even that comes with problems then, because you don't want somebody to have a censoring role in art. Um, so it's a big problem um, in, in general. I mean, my, the, the models for me have always been the alternative spaces in New, York, in New York City that I grew up with, like artist space and so forth, uh, where it was a combination of different sor funding sources that, that kept those things afloat. And it was the people who were running the spaces who made decisions about what was going to be shown. Uh, but we have very few of those spaces left now. So it's a, it's too bad, yeah. I also I also love the idea of artists, uh, collectives and cooperatives, artists working together. I mean, it's it's a, it's difficult, you know, to keep particularly now where cities have gentrified. Uh, you can't live in Manhattan really anymore, um, and been pushed out to the other parts of the uh, city. But I think it's a, still a, a model to strive for. Any other questions? Uh, I 
I think we've danced around it all night, um, but we haven't really faced it directly. But what can art do in this cl political climate? If I take the role of an optimist and assume we can use it, uh, how do we begin to cross the chasm in America right now and bridge sides through art? Or is it too far gone? Well, uh, I, I think a lot depends on um, how you define art, what art is, and what is art. Um, I, I, again, I'll point to what I mentioned with the, um, during the AIDS crisis and ACT UP. And that was, that was a, a movement uh, a, a consisting of artists, founded by artists, considered to be a performance art of some kind. And it did, was enormously effective at that time. It was the one thing so carefully choreographed and thought through every move that they made that it really did finally force the government to cough up the money. And it worked. It was art that worked, you know, basically. I mean, some people consider the, the Women's March uh, in 2016 to be a form of performance art. Which, um, so you can, it depends on how you can interpret it. But, um, you know, I think it's circumstantial. And you, every time out is, a, is kind of a crapshoot. You know, you don't know. But um, Olu's monument caused a lot of talk and a lot of consciousness raising uh, at, at the Documenta. And it's both, both it's when it was there and because of its disappearance. So it really was a, was a fulcrum for a lot of thinking uh, within Europe about, uh, not only about the immigration issue, but also the censorship issue. And it brought the, it brought the right wing out of hiding basically, in some ways, do you know? It really did, they, they came out forcefully. So suddenly you knew, oh, there is this radically rightist element in our society that is now feeling emboldened to speak out, and it was in reaction to his art. So I think it was a very, very uh, uh, useful <laughs> art, piece of art. I think the, our, our can, present condition is um, seemingly peculiar, but obviously, like he said, it's happening in Europe as well. Um, it was already happening in the Philippines, um, even in Brazil, and it's going to happen even worse in Brazil now. Uh, so there's a global trend of sorts. Um, and. Uh, Yes, I, I, like I said, I, I, you know, there, there's several possibilities. Um, there are several ways in which artists can respond. They can respond to their work, but they can also respond as ordinary citizens who are concerned. Um, it doesn't always have to be to the work of art. Um, because if you're uh, an airline pilot who is concerned, you, you may not be able to respond to what's happening now through your uh, flying airplanes. You know, there has to be some other way for you to respond. And, and I think artists can do that too. You know, they may not be willing to respond using their work, but they can definitely respond to organizing, to um, supporting activities. I always give, the, I don't know why I use that, but I always give the example of Pablo Picasso. As I guess because if you're from a certain, if you're from the 20th century, you have to uh, recognize that. <laughs> some of us are from the 20th century. Um, and, and he was someone, also because he was someone who made the kind of work that everyone likes to identify with, you know. Um, far right, far left, doesn't matter. They all find something uh, to identify with in, in Picasso's work. But he was a card-carrying member of the Communist Party all his life. And he supported you know, lots of um, progressive causes around the world. Not necessarily by making art about it, although he did sometimes, uh, but sometimes by making work that helped fundraising for causes designing logos or making donations. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of ways in which as artists, as citizens, 
not necessarily artists as artists, but also artists as citizens can um, be part of resisting what's happening uh, around the world. And, and uh, I, I was reading some uh, interview in uh, Deutsche Welle, which is this uh, German uh, publication, and they, they spoke to a, a woman who is a, a survivor of the uh, Kristallnacht, the, the first po pogrom in the 1930s when Nazis smashed Jewish shops and people died also. And uh, her advice was fight the beginning um, before it becomes the norm. You know, before people get used to the kind of uh, vulgarism that's rearing its head again now, she, she warned that we have to fight it from the beginning. Otherwise, it, people thought it was a joke in, in the 1930s. Oh, those knuckleheads, you know, um, there's just a few of them. They're crazy. And before you knew it, everyone was crazy and everyone was a knucklehead. And everyone then eventually denied that they knew what happened. So um, we don't have to necessarily wait to find ways to use our art. If it doesn't come naturally, if it's not part of someone's practice, they don't have to change their practice to respond to the situation in my thinking. But they can find other ways as citizens who are concerned to uh, r respond to the situation. And I find that uh, supporting causes or showing up um, in Castle, for instance, the architect who was part of making my work was very active, not true architecture, but true organizing uh, against the far right and, and the, the push to, uh, um, to begin to police uh, creative and artistic expression related to humanist ideas. So there's all those possibilities and people don't have to wait to do a true artistic practice. Could I add a little bit to that? Just a simple comment. I mean, agreeing with everything that Olu has said, uh, but, I, but I want to kind of, um, in, in making this uh, um, lecture and this uh, series, I am, I am hoping that this conversation too open for you guys, uh, young thinkers and young makers, uh, other questions about uh, uh, the condition and the and the what we define what is art. And uh, we are putting many examples of 20th century, 20th trans transitioning. But I wonder uh, what are the possible responses possible path uh, to be explored. I, that, that is what I make in this, this series, to really uh, try and from, uh, Adam said a few minutes ago about these questions that I am trying to place to, they come, they have very far back root. I am a romantic, by the way. Everybody that know me know that. So anytime the romanticism come around me, it's try and target. But uh, what else? is there, uh, what, are, what are the language, what are the methodologies, what are, I love the monument, uh, the obelisk in Castle, because it's a beautiful piece about reaching back to history and culture and loaded with new meaning. The obelisk who was a non-Western symbol taken back to the center of a cultural hold place, which is Castle and Documenta, and loaded with a commentary about a very urgent issue of our moment, who was the terrible crisis of the refugee in Kassel, in Germany. Uh, it's a beauty in there about uh, this um, uh, back for and then future, which we, we, which we don't know. But I am, I am curious myself in placing the question and uh, structuring the, the series about what else, what else is there, and um, what are the methodologies that we may be no accents yet? This is what I say, what is the territory to uncover? 
what are the places to conquer? And I use an old bad language, conquer. That sounds like a people trying imperialist, trying to hold off of other places. But it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor to open the conversation with more, more in, inquisitive and, and unsettling in a way. I, I want, I feel myself in a position of a instability. I do. And I want to think that younger artists and younger thinkers too, and the art that we aspire to, maybe is in the same territory. It's maybe in the same uh, uh, stage of uh, questioning uncertainty, uh, a need to open uh, new problems. Uh, and I think, well, what are those? What are those? Uh, as a maker, that is, I think that that is an important uh, question. I want to come back to, briefly, to when Olu was mentioned, his littered uh, extra painting that he does in his studio. And I was thinking, for me, as a, as a viewer, they are equally important as the monument, in a way. So, I, I think that is an open uh, uh, um, territory to, to, to think about. Except, let me add there, j just briefly, except of course that we, 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 we could then, or rather we should at the same time be conscious of what you were pointing out as to how abstraction can become a, a means of escape from dealing with issues. It becomes a preferred uh, form of expression when people are trying to avoid dealing uh, with issues. Luckily, in my, well, maybe, maybe in my case too, you know, I'm not in a mood to deal with issues, you know, maybe I escape to, to abstraction. But one has to be very aware of the, the, um, the uses of abstraction, I suppose. I think we are at time, so thank you all There's for. Oh, one questions. more? Okay, last we can take one more. There are two questions, that's the last two. Hello, thanks for coming, and thank you to Magda for bringing such a good artist here. And my question is related to Cuba, but it's. Um, to Olu, I want to ask something to him. We have in Cuba three main religions, Afro-Cuban religions, uh, Palo Monte, Santeria, and also Abacua religion. The Abacua religion came uh, through all the Carabali slaves who came from old Calabar, now uh, Nigeria. And there is this foundational myth about Sikang a woman who goes to the river and accidentally imprisoned the Tanse fish, a sacred fish, and Nasako, the chief of the village, uh, killed this woman. And uh, the Abacuas took, took that myth as a foundational myth. And I was wondering if maybe this tradition of violence against women could be found through this myth, because for example, in Cuba, in literature and art, they use the myth of Sikang to express violence against women and to, um, so if you can speak about this, if you yeah, know. That, that, thanks, that's actually a very interesting question. Um, the, the, the myth among the Akwai, um, the Mamewata um, a myth, uh, it's very interesting in the sense that um, you know, my, my first foray into feminist uh, criticism was at a time when in Nigeria, for instance, feminism was not popular. Um, womanism was among uh, Nigerian scholars, especially true African-American uh, interest in womanism at the time. This is in the 80s, but feminism was not. And I began by looking at the way in which women are um, deified, but then violently defiled as well by the same people who deify them. So the, the 
those myths of foundational women um, who may or may not be uh, violently attacked are in real life violently um, assaulted and attacked and that's, that was pretty much part of the culture which no one likes to acknowledge. Uh, so maybe in, in a sense there's something there that goes back to uh, an old source of the contemporary culture of violence um, against women. It's, it's, uh, as you can imagine, it's not popular to talk about it, um, but I'm, I'm happy that more and more people, are, including younger people, are beginning to talk about it. Not so much in West Africa, um, but, and I'm hoping that that will change. But in, in places like South Africa, for instance, more and more people are beginning to address the endemic problem of uh, violence against women. Uh, I talk about it, you know, um, and, and it's, it's, very, it's very problematic because it's very deeply entrenched in these cultures. And I, I don't think that it's originally part of the cultures, I wouldn't go as far, but there's been all sorts of historical and social contributions toward normalizing over a long time, you know, normative violence towards women. I can't even go into how you learn to, to um, as a young person, as a young man growing up, how you learn to deal with the uh, other sex, it, it's mostly through violence. Um, and today, it, it, it's become a, a touchstone, if you like, in South African discourses, because young South Africans would always use it as an excuse. Oh, you have no idea how difficult it is for us growing up as young black men in South Africa. And that becomes an excuse to be violent towards women. It, it never makes uh, a great deal of sense to me, as though it's easy to be a young black woman growing up in South Africa. Um, but yes, I think there's a long history there, and that's why it's, it's going to take a lot of work um, and a lot of collective effort to begin to unravel it first so that people can acknowledge and then hopefully re-educate. Re uh, so, it, but it's, that's a very interesting thing you pointed out. I hadn't thought about it, in fact. Did ha that help? Did, was, was that a good answer? Okay. Uh, greetings, good evening. Um, to Magdalena, you posed a question on what are those new ways that we can combat those systems that um, in the same breath oppress uh, us while they say that they offer salvation. Um, this is something that I've struggled with uh, personally, especially recently, and I'm in the middle of a few books right now that are trying to give me some insight. But as far as whatever the suggestion is, um, and I'm no expert, so don't crucify me for this. But um, a few weeks ago, I heard this quote that uh, you have to make the resistance irresistible. And so um, that's like literally been like in the back of my mind for um, ever since I heard it. And it was something that was like very beautiful and profound to me. But like, I feel that um, in terms of moving forward, we need to channel those things that aren't technically conventional. And as much as I love like monuments and things like things like that, they're statements and they're very site specific. I think something needs to be very provocative and in our face and utilizing the technology of today. Um, I'm not a religious person, but um, in most of our formative or um, 
more conventional methods of seeking whatever spirituality or whatever, um, whatever is going to lead us to the path of enlightenment, there's always this myth or this story that that great enlightenment is going to hit people simultaneously and it's gonna be some type of great awakening. So using that, I feel like this is the vehicle for it. And um, where was I trying to say? Uh, give me a second. Yeah, it's gonna be, that. that is the vehicle for it and we also, we have to use our aesthetic intelligence to make that something that's so sexy, that's so irresistible that you have to jump on board. Um, and me personally, as a creator and somebody who's just trying to be a creative being in this place and use my art responsibly, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I feel like that is the mode, modus operandi for bringing on that cultural shift or that, that psychological shift or whatever. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, but thank you all, and I really appreciate your guys' discussion. Thank you. Thanks to the Fritz for the hosting us and uh, Fisk for hosting us tomorrow, Vanderbilt for um, trust me in this uh, endeavor. And thank you to the students, the faculty, the people from the town that are here. And um, we are trying to turn this uh, conversation into a publication. Eventually when we manage to clear all the ideas that have been in the table here tonight. So please, uh, looking forward to see you uh, next year in Our Democracy and Justice Part Two. Thank you.